Thank you for taking the time to attend our presentation, Beyond Meaningful Use, Enhancing the Patient Experience with HIT Confirmation. Our speaker today is Mike Elvis. As a practice director of patient experience in our professional services division at Iatric Systems, Mike's work, Mike works closely with hospitals, nursing facilities, and other organizations to enhance patient and staff engagement while improving health outcomes. Mike has an intensive healthcare communications background, which includes marketing deployment at Boston's Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, as well as the patient engagement and internal communications at the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City. Now I'll turn it over to Mike to get us started. All right, thank you, Michelle. Um, so thanks to all of you for joining me today. I'm going to present some best practices in patient engagement. And really, no matter what your background is, the aim is to share some tips you can use in your organization, or at least share with other key decision makers. So let's go through uh, some of the take home points today. Number one, understand how patient engagement is linked to the overall patient experience. Number two, learn how to design a roadmap for an improved patient experience. And number three, learn how to enhance adoption of your patient portal and your additional mHealth options, both publicly and internally. So before we begin, uh, we're going to kick off the presentation by asking you a question uh, to sort of get a baseline of where you are with patient-facing tech. Uh, so Michelle, if you want to bring up that question. Okay, so the question, in regards to new patient-focused technology, which best describes your hospital's current state? And you can select any one of these three. Number one, interested in new technology but don't know where to start, have no idea how to begin the process. Number two, researching new HIT but we don't have the funds at this time, uh, hearing that a lot lately. And then the third, we have a portal, we don't see a need for additional HIT. So if you want to click on one of those, and then click Submit. We can go over the uh, responses in just a few seconds here. It looks like people are still entering, so we're going to give you a little bit more time. OK, I'll give it just a few more moments, and then I will close it. Okay, looks like we're split a little bit down the middle. Um, interested in new technology but don't know where to start. This is a very common refrain. And also we have a portal. We don't see a need for additional HIT. Um, I imagine there are lots of fires being put out in different areas and uh, people are putting a lot of their patient engagement eggs into the portal basket, which is just fine. Um, hopefully this presentation will give you a little bit of an expanded view of what's down the pike, what you can expect, and new technologies. So Michelle, I will take back over here. OK. All right, so before we talk about looking beyond meaningful use, let's look directly at the concept of meaningful use as it's defined by CMS. Um, that's sort of the the rule guidelines we're following right now. So let's talk about those. So CMS states that meaningful use of HIT must, number one, improve quality, safety, efficiency, and reduce health disparities. Number two, engage patients and family, improve care coordination and population and public health, and finally, maintain privacy and security of patient health information. So in other words, when you use HIT meaningfully and when your patients also use these technologies uh, meaningfully. All these elements are meant to come into fruition. That's sort of the, the goal here. But what has the focus been? Uh, what technologies have we sort of relied upon to get this done? Well, in uh, stage one, it was all about the EMRs and the, uh, the provider-facing tech. And then in stage two, we started to get into the patient-facing technology in, in terms of patient portals. And that's when patient engagement started to kick in as well. And looking forward into uh, the future with stage three, at least the proposed rules uh, are more about APIs, apps, different ways to get the technology out there, um, not just in patient portals, but 
and applications, smartphone applications, desktop applications, uh, secure messaging, uh, direct messaging, and patient-generated data. So we're already looking more toward what the, what the patient, we're sort of meeting the patient where they are in terms of applications and patient-generated data. But where do these technologies fit into the patient experience? What's the point of all this? So uh, how do we expect that this relationship will bear fruit? How will uh, HIT help to strengthen this relationship? Well, in terms of what CMS is looking to do, uh, they're hoping that meaningful use compliance will result in uh, the five following things, better clinical outcomes, improved population health outcomes, increased transparency, increased efficiency, empowerment, and a more robust uh, rate research data on which to, uh, to draw from in terms of health systems. And we can sort of distill this down further into the triple aim. I think we're all familiar with that, but improving the cost of healthcare, improving population health, and finally improving the patient experience. And that's why we're here today. So let's begin with where we are now. What's the patient experience like in 2015? Uh, a lot of us are focused on stage two. That focus is all about patient-centered care. But what is patient-centered care? What does that mean? What does it look like right now? Well, I'm going to illustrate it for you. This is kind of what it looks like in 2015. And you know, to be fair, the patient is right there in the center, but there's something missing here. And the doctors are paying no attention to the patient. Uh, where is the communication? Where's the relationship? So. Uh, this is definitely a problem, and just in case this seems like sort of an extreme example, it is a cartoon, it's meant to be an extreme example, but let's look at this next picture here. This drawing appeared on the cover of the Journal of the AMA in 2012. It was drawn by a uh, seven-year-old, and you can see that seven-year-old uh, second from the right there. And that, uh, that wasn't actually the patient. The patient's sitting right in the middle, and the seven-year-old sister is the patient, but know where the doctor is. Uh, the doctor is all the way over on the left, typing something into a computer, not looking at the patient, not looking at the family. And uh, unfortunately, this is sort of the, the reality in a lot of cases these days. And I mean, really, though, this does not look like patient engagement. This is not what patient engagement is supposed to be all about. So not a positive patient experience at all. So. The system appears to be broken in, in many ways. And although I personally believe in, in the promise of HIT and patient engagement, there are some things we have to focus on so we don't lose our way and, and find our, our way down the path we don't want to go down. So we, we can fix this, and we're going to talk about how. So uh, the following four points, what's out there, how can it help and hurt in terms of uh, HIT and working with patients? What is patient engagement exactly, and how does it tie in with patient experience? So let's look at some of the technologies uh, we, we currently have. Uh, according to Technology Advice in a survey they did recently, a full quarter of adults in the US are now using uh, either a fitness tracker, some sort of mHealth smartphone app, uh, or a Fitbit, what have you, to track their health, uh, their weight, or their exercise. That is a lot of people, and it's only growing. Um, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation put out a really exceptional report a few months ago. Uh, they found that there are 56,000 of these apps and devices, a huge number, uh, which they say will actually grow by 25% a year. And they're looking toward the future, 2018, 1.7 billion people worldwide will download a health app. And that sort of floored me, but that's where we're going. Uh, and then. You know, these are just some examples of HIT. There are hundreds of them and thousands of iterations, but these are uh, sort of what we're looking at in terms of HIT in 2015. And it spans from EHRs, uh, you know, this is uh, provider focused, but some of these are, are patient focused also. It's portals, uh, APIs, wearables, uh, HIEs can benefit both providers and patients, obviously. Uh, telemedicine, discharge applications. One that sort of stuck out to me uh, was a new house call app. You may have read about this in, in the New York Times. It's called Heal. And you can actually have a house call. Uh, you can, it's sort of like Uber. You can order it right over your phone, 
the physician arrives in 20 to 60 minutes for a flat fee of $99. It's crazy where we're going, but a lot of people love that app. A lot of people are using them. Uh, these are really taking off. Uh, we'll talk about why, but first we have another very quick poll, and I'm going to hand it over to Michelle. Okay, so in regard to your patient's experience and satisfaction, which option is most similar to the situation at your hospital? Number one, our patients are generally satisfied. No issues, or at least very few issues in terms of uh, experience, satisfaction, uh, communication issues, things like that. Number two, our patients frequently complain about miscommunication, whether it's uh, discharge instructions or appointments, what have you. And then number three, I have no idea if our patients are satisfied. It's not really my, my area of expertise. I'll give you a few minutes to, to click on one of those and then click on submit. Scratch that, not a few minutes, <laughs> more like 20 seconds if you uh, are able to do that. I have a full slate of uh, slides here that I have to get through, so let's see how we're doing. Okay, I'll just give everyone just a couple of more moments to finish the poll, and then I'll close it and launch the results. All right, it looks like um, our patients frequently complain about miscommunication. No shock there. Uh, that is a major issue in, uh, in the quality of care today. Uh, followed closely by, I have no idea if our patients are satisfied. That's fine. may not be your area of expertise. Um, and then quite a few of you, almost a fifth, say your patients are generally satisfied. Amazing. Keep up the good work. Uh, that's tough to do. All right, so let's go back to my screen here. Okay. So in looking at this, this diagram, uh, I sort of put this together just to show how it is sort of a, a cyclical event. Uh, the benefits of HIT can, can really feed upon themselves. So let's talk about the benefits to the patient first. Um, this includes more involvement in care education about their condition. Uh, they're kept on the loop in terms of communicating with their, with their doctor or provider outside the care setting at their convenience. That's a big part of it. It's convenient for them. Uh, tracking their health. We just talked about fitness trackers, um, but also tracking their health in terms of lab results and uh, Mike? Uh, levels. Yes. Sorry. Excuse me. Um, your screen is still paused. We can't see oh, what you're talking about. Okay. Okay. How's that? That's better. Thank you. All right. Apologies. Okay, so this is the diagram, uh, and talking about the, the benefits to the patient, uh, tracking their health, keeping tabs on their exercise, making appointments, tracking their meds. You have it; it's it's there, and it's getting more and more functionality by the day. Uh, basically, it gives them more more control, and it puts them in their sort of healthcare cockpit, so to speak. Now, uh, benefits to providers: efficiencies in care. So. Patients are managing their bills, their appointments, they're being more in tune with their condition, so there's the benefit of sort of being closer to the same page with, with uh, a care plan, whatever that care plan might be. And there's also marked cost effectiveness, and that helps shift some of that accountability to the patient, which is a, a sort of a big deal this, uh, this time around. We're looking to shift some of that accountability, as it should be with patient-centered care, the accountability should be shifted that way to the patient. We'll get into some of these cost benefits in a moment. Um, in terms of improved access for patients and caregivers, uh, the data and communication flowing back and forth with a model to sort of expand that data transfer bidirectionally in the coming years. And that's coming to fruition now. Um, that, that data is transferring bidirectionally, whether it's patient-generated data or lab data, it's, it's going both ways. And it's really in its infancy right now. Uh, it's largely data and information flowing from the provider to the patient, but patients are seeking more and more access, and they're going to get it, and that's sort of how we're, how we're going. So this is what patient engagement is really all about. Uh, the concept is that if patients are using HIT to become engaged in their own health, 
working toward better outcomes, they're sort of fulfilling that goal. Uh, but there's just as many ways to define patient engagement as there are ways to engage patients. I think most would agree that you can sort of boil the benefits down to these five points, though. So let's, let's talk about these. First, information. Uh, being informed about their condition, ways to improve their health. Uh, in terms of access, having a direct line to their medical history, uh, their provider, their educational goals, fitness tools, um, and most importantly, their health information. Um, empowerment, and that's all about having the means by which to take uh, really confident control of their health, to make better health decisions, to correct incorrect data that they find in their portal, uh, and also to know that their voice, beliefs are heard, and they're being taken into account by the provider. Uh, talk a little bit about accountability, and this is really about possessing, uh, you know, this kind of control and requiring them to sort of take a stake in their health, realizing that when they're armed with this information, they can own certain decisions, and it can be theirs, and they can they can feel empowered to, to go here and there, and that sort of fosters accountability. Uh, but it's really not engagement without action. That's sort of where it comes comes down to. Providing the, the tools does not equal patient engagement, and it's sort of a build it and they will come scenario. They, they won't come if you just build it. You have to actually get patients to use them, and there's the rub, and that's what a lot of us are dealing with right now, especially in core six of uh, meaningful use stage two. So let's get back to those benefits to the provider, uh, because this is sort of a, a great way to, to sell this internally, uh, specifically with patient portals and APIs and apps. And these are um, sort of direct correlations to patient engagement from an administrative perspective anyway. So you can take a look at some of these figures. Uh, the first one, reduction in phone calls to and from the office, uh, amounting up to $6 per call. That's a lot of money. Uh, that was reported by IBM Healthcare. Uh, $0.63 cents for each lab result, not sent by snail mail. Uh, that was from Health Partners. $17 for every billing query handled online. Uh, $7 for every appointment scheduled online. Uh, again, lots of money that adds up here. North Shore University Health System uh, put that in a report. Uh, and that's one that's been cited by a lot of people because obviously those are, those are big numbers. So you can attach value to, to each of these elements. Your mileage may vary. These are just some numbers, but they were proven to be, to be true. But I think the, the biggest benefit to your administration is um, at least on a provider to provider basis, asynchronous management. So this means that staff can be way more flexible in addressing some of the requests they receive throughout the day, and they get a lot of them. They don't have to drop whatever they're doing right away. They don't have to you know, pick up the phone on the 18th ring because they're with the patient. Uh, you know, when, they, when they receive a phone call, it's, it could be any time during the day when they're doing any number of different things. So this translates into increased productivity during office hours. And also, as importantly, they have a record of the efforts they've made to communicate with, uh, with patients. So these are all things you can share with your staff in terms of, you know, these are the benefits to you, this is what's in it for you going to some of these uh, technologies. So these are real benefits on the provider side of things. And let's talk about some of the drawbacks, because we all know about some of these drawbacks and limitations of uh, health information technology. So workflow disruption and value. Uh, the initial workflow disruption, not going to lie, it is a problem. Uh, I direct iatric uh, patient engagement services. I sort of oversee those services. And we help hospitals maximize adoption of, of their patient portals. That's sort of one game that we have. Uh, but the, the number one challenge at the sites we've worked with, uh, I'd say bar none, is changing workflows to incorporate HIT in discussions with patients about portals and other technologies. And it's so hard to break routines. I think we all know that. And especially when people are sort of already feeling squeezed for time, which we all are. Um, and dependent upon that actually is the value proposition. So if the value for the patient isn't there, if it's not conveyed, if it's if it's just not interesting to them, if they don't see the benefits, um, they're probably not going to use that technology. So even if you give them access, and even if they use it, and they don't see any value in it, then uh, they're going to stop using it. So 
what we really need to do is, is to look through the patient's eyes and see that value and make sure it's there. So obviously patients are concerned about security and privacy. That's, that's a big deal wherever you go. Younger patients less so, uh, but particularly older populations. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit in a study I'll, I'll discuss. Uh, but perhaps most importantly, the perceived loss of the personal touch, and I'm going to talk a lot about this too. And this goes back to that cartoon of the docs sort of staring at their screens, not at the patient. We're in such a checkbox mentality that some of us, um, you know, we just focus on on those checkboxes instead of the patient sitting in front of them. So um, I'll give you some tips to find other ways to involve the patient, even when you're punching information into the EMR in the exam room, which uh, you know has to happen. We have to do that, but we can do it in a certain way, and I'll go over that. So let's talk about the patient experience. What is it, where does it uh, fit into our efforts to enhance HIT? Uh, so here are two de uh, definitions of, of patient experience that I really think gets the heart and soul of what it's all about. So uh, the first one here from the Barrel Institute, patient experience is the sum of all interactions shaped by an organization's culture that influence patient perceptions across the continuum of care. And this one from the Cleveland Clinic, world famous for their patient experience efforts, uh, providing world-class care while addressing the patient's physical, educational, emotional, and spiritual needs. So when we talk about enhancing the, the patient experience with HIT, let's look into what patients and providers have to say about it in the next couple of slides here. So I'm going to uh, go over three reports that came out pretty recently about um, patient experience and engagement. So I mentioned the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation report. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. It's really interesting, really comprehensive report about patient data, uh, patient information, population health. So here's the goal as they stated it, uh, what they wanted to do with this report. Uh, so I'm going to quote them here. As part of the initiative, the foundation held five symposia across the country with high-level participants in the fields of healthcare, public health, technology, and other related sectors to discuss barriers and, and possibilities related to the transformation of patient data into actionable health information. So they also invited patients to participate, which is a really interesting way to do it, and not a lot of people have, have done that. So they found that um, younger patients are more comfortable with data sharing, and they even expect it. And uh, older patients do not generally share that comfort level uh, beyond their relationship with their primary care physician. One provider noted uh, that, quote unquote, we need to more carefully listen to the stories behind the data. The data may help give us the answers, but it's the stories that tell us which questions to ask. And people also want long data. So long data is data that tracks their individual health over time. Uh, it allows them to see patterns and trends along with their provider. And they want their personal health data to move with them, uh, to have it be mobile. And whether that's across doctor's offices, hospitals, other caretaker settings, they want it to be interoperable. So Owen, the ONC has taken heed to this, and, and they just released their interoperability roadmap uh, this past February, and, and it's a priority for them, as I think it, it really should be. It's about time. So speaking of roadmaps, uh, patient attendees for this uh, symposium described wanting a roadmap that not only tells them their personal health information, but also tells them what actions to take, and uh, they need it to be presented in a way that's understandable in order to make that data actionable. So really great report. As I mentioned, if you haven't seen it, go out, check it out. It's called Data for Health, Learning What Works. Okay, so uh, the second study here um, was from Software Advice, and this is sort of interesting. I'm going to fly through this, but one-third of patients currently have access to a patient portal. Two-thirds either do not have access or are unsure. When asked to name their top frustration with portals, respondents cited unresponsive staff and confusing interface. And that's 34% said unresponsive staff, 33% said confusing interface, almost equally. So that's uh, certainly an issue. Older patients and men are more interested in appointment and prescription fill, uh, refill requests. Younger patients and women see the portal as a tool for viewing these 
uh, test results and making payment. So different people do different things, and that's one thing that we have to realize is we can't just give them a portal and say, do this on it. We have to sort of tell each demographic what's in it for them uh, specifically. So they have three pieces of advice that I'll share with you uh, at this point. Uh, number one, ensure features align with practice demographics, uh, which is what I just sort of mentioned. Number two, take your portal and app for a test drive. Make sure it, it works the way it's supposed to work. Um, make sure the patient is seeing it the same way you're going to see it. And then number three, consider future patient preferences. Okay, third and last report. This one is from Xerox, came out in January. They're famous for, for their report, their annual report, um, all about patients, providers, and emerging HIT. So 43% of millennials prefer to access patient portals on their smartphones, and this is only going to grow. This number is definitely getting bigger. Among those who did not use their portal, 35% said they weren't aware a patient portal was unavailable. Of those who did use patient portals, 59% said they have been much more interested in their personal health care since they began using it. That's a great number. And 56% of baby boomers said they would be more engaged in their hair, sorry, in their care if their medical information was online. This speaks to the stat about you know not being aware it's available. That's that's a that shouldn't be the case. If you have a portal, your patients should know it, and we're we're going to get to that. Uh, closer to the end of this presentation about marketing. In many cases, patients just don't know, and that's really an easy fix. So I'm going to go all over that in a little bit. So there's a lot of talk about whether patients are consumers. Are they consumers? Are they patients? What are they in our current landscape? I would argue that they certainly bit, uh, sort of fit the bill uh, for consumers. They are both. They're patients. They're consumers. But you know, in our value-based care model, they're they're becoming more consumer, and, and uh, that's just sort of the reality of, of our current landscape. So they have options. In other words, the surveys are showing that it, it's the majority of them that are, you know, they they value digital access to their providers. Um, they love a focus on patient experience. They appreciate value-based care. So technology advice reported in January that 60. 0.8% uh, percent of patients they surveyed said that digital services played an important role when choosing a physician. And again, this number is only getting bigger, 68.8%. Uh, also, now that healthcare costs are more transparent, patients are much more savvy about recognizing un unnecessary tests. Uh, and they can shop around, they can choose the right fit for them provider-wise, they have much more of a choice. And M health options are definitely becoming a factor in that choice. And with that transparency comes sort of a new sense of accountability. Again, there's that word, accountability, which is ripe for the introduction of uh, patient engagement tools. So we're being set up for success, even though sometimes it doesn't feel that way, but we're moving in the right, in the right direction here. So after several years of personally uh, you know, digesting study after study, I do a lot of research, articles after articles, uh, I've come to these conclusions, and I'll, I'll share them with you here. So patients want the following things, more control, even if they're sharing it, uh, open lines of communication to their providers, bi-directional communication, uh, safety, privacy, obviously, um, a roadmap, roadmap for making good health choices, encouragement, they love to be encouraged, uh, reward system is, is a great way to go when trying to improve health, even if it's something as silly as, you know, earn points to get a cup of coffee or, or something like that. Uh, less expensive, more diverse options for care. Obviously, I think we all want that. Uh, they want to speak in their native language. They don't want to go through jargon. They want to be informed about their condition. They want their doctors to dress in formal attire. That one kind of threw me for a loop, but interesting. Uh, they want healthcare to be easy. They want it to be affordable. Again, we all want that. And then to build a relationship with their caregivers and ultimately to feel cared for. So the combination of all these uh, technologies, you know, we're talking about, and the ones I showed you on a, on a, uh, on a slide a few slides ago, uh, they enhance the patient experience by addressing all of those wants and needs. Um, not completely, you know. Obviously, there's not much we can do about the dress code problem. That's up to doctors, but HIT does have a hand in the others. Uh, but really, the most important thing we have to remember is. Um, 
technology requires human guidance. It can't do it by itself. We have relationships to build. We have relationships to, to maintain. And, you know, there was a presenter at this year's Patient Experience Summit in, in Cleveland that I attended uh, a couple months ago. Uh, he showed us how technology will someday run the risk of replacing us. Um, it scared everyone to death. Uh, but there's one thing that we have over machines, the human touch. It's a very powerful thing. It cannot be replaced by technology. Um, that's something I'm going to keep talking about, so brace yourselves. But uh, this concept of the human touch, and it, it's actually about the larger concept of the personal touch, more than just the physical touch. But this is a great quote. Um, this is from, I don't know if it's Jeannie or Jean Ebe Marco at NYU, and um, it is uh, just a fantastic quote. Uh, Touch is our body's largest and the oldest sense. It's a channel of communication, and it's integral to the human experience. We won't get very far with HIT unless we, you know, we take interest in our patients at a personal level and provide that human touch. And I, I think we all know that at a human level, uh, you know, that's where the patient experience starts. And without this hands-on care, we've really alienated the patient. Uh, like in that cartoon I showed you earlier, um, human touch can't be replaced. And we can't lose sight of that as we promote technology to our patients. Um, you know, it holds a lot of promise, technology does, but it really only enhances the high level of care we, we always strive to provide no matter what. Um, and this, you know, this, this quote sort of res resonated with me, especially coming from NYU. Uh, because my daughter was a patient at NYU when we lived in, in New York, and she was undergoing surgery um, a few years ago. And we were, as parents, we were provided, you know, we were provided with all sorts of, you know, pamphlets and, you know, expect this and expect that, and this is, this is what happens, and this is what your role is going to be. Um, so we were educated about the procedure, and we joined Facebook groups for parents with uh, uh, kids with cleft uh, palates, and our daughter had a cleft lip and palate, and she was getting her, her surgery to correct that. Uh, we couldn't have been more engaged in our daughter's care. It was, you know, we knew everything about what was going to happen, but when we saw our daughter recovering from surgery, um, you know, her face was bloody and puffy, and she was just a mess, and I was a mess, and my wife was a mess, but this nurse came by, and, you know, she touched us on the shoulder. She made eye contact with us. Um, she was holding my daughter's foot, uh, and my daughter stopped crying for a little while, and, and she asked her if she wanted to watch a video. And my daughter had a, had a favorite show at the time. It's called Trotro. And uh, this nurse walked all over the ward, and it took her maybe 25 minutes to find this video, but she found it, and she put it on for my daughter, and my daughter stopped crying. It was just amazing. So uh, long story short, that personal touch, that human touch, and that physical touch go just so far. So that's one thing we have to keep in mind as we, as we move forward. Uh, so the goal here is investing in high tech without losing sight of the importance of, of high touch care. And it's about building relationships with patients, continuing them, uh, you know, using HIT outside of the care setting. So it's a continuous care setting that can go with the patients. It's not just discharge instructions, it's a whole suite of services. So uh, let's talk a little bit about some ways we can maintain that balance, uh, the high touch, high tech balance, and some quick suggestions that might work for you. So these tips are borrowed from various sources. Um, one great, great source is Dr. Trina Dora's patient experience blog, that's T-R-I-N-A if you're taking notes. Uh, D-O-R-R-A-H. She's a doctor um, from the Midwest, and she, she runs this great blog about patient experience. Um, so that's just one, one source here, but I'm going to go through these. So when the uh, doctor or provider is, is sort of coming into the room, uh, there's the opening. So you introduce yourself, uh, talk about your role at the org organization to everyone in the room, not just the patient. Um, you know, if they're family members, friends, what have you, introduce yourself to, to everyone. If they've been waiting, and they probably have been, you can quickly thank them for, for coming, apologize for the wait, uh, and by all means, pull up a chair and sit down. Patients don't want to sort of be 
physically uh, spoken spoken down to. And I think that's one thing that that I learned having a, a primary care physician that sat down at my level and, and talked to me that way. Uh, in terms of attention at the beginning of the meaningful use process, I I went to see my primary care physician, and um, you know I waited for a while in in the exam room. He finally came in. He didn't say a single word to me for about two minutes. He just sat in front of the computer and tap tap tapped away. Looked at my patient history, and then only after about two minutes, he turned to me and, and said, "So what's the problem?" You know, that's not a good way to. Uh, to begin a conversation with, with the patient. So needless to say, I found a, a new doctor. But that's one thing you want to avoid. Um, in terms of incorporating the computer, uh, it's, you know, unfortunately, it's a necessary evil in this day and age. There are some best practices for using it in the presence of patients. And uh, Dr. Dora um, has a great way to do this. So the best way to start off is by ignoring the computer for just a few minutes as you greet the patient listen to what they have to tell you, and then when you do start using it, if possible, position the screen so the patient is sort of incorporated into the process of, of record, uh, recording what they're conveying. And then, uh, you know, some providers are really uncomfortable with showing the screen to patients. It really goes a long way toward preventing the sense that there is sort of an invisible wall, maybe not so invisible, uh, between the patient and the provider. So it's also a great opportunity to sort of discuss their access via the patient portal, uh, any smartphone apps, you know, I'm looking at the screen that has all your information on it, but another way to do it is to go home, look on your patient portal, and you'll have the same access to this information. You'll see the, the report and, um, you know, your, your, your labs and your levels, all that stuff that I can see, you'll be able to see too. Um, also, secure messaging, you know, another great way for doctors to, to say, you know, if you have any questions, you can email me. I get it right up on the screen. I can I can respond to you ASAP. Uh, all right, education. Avoiding medical jargon whenever possible. Some are admittedly better than others at it. Uh, it's critically important. The National Assessment of uh, Adult Literacy uh, ran a study. They found that only 12% of U.S. adults had proficient health literacy. Only half were able to read their prescription label take their medications at the right time. Scary, scary numbers. So one way to educate patients is to use the teach back method. And I don't know if you've heard of it, but this is sort of to uh, confirm whether a patient understands what's being explained to them. If they do understand, they'll sort of be able to teach back the information to you accurately. It's another great way, another great opportunity to, sh to sort of let them know that information about their meds other directives can be accessed online. You know, teach it back to me, yes, right, but you know, if, if you forget, you'll be able to find this stuff online. Uh, so let's talk about SATS, S-A-T-S. It's a quick and easy way to remember the essentials. Uh, it stands for sit down, avoid medical lingo, teach back, and summarize. And summarizing throughout the, the visit, it's an excellent way to make sure you've heard the patient's concerns, great way to wrap up the visit. And finally, uh, this was just fantastic. I, I picked this up at, at HIMSS, at the, the HIMSS uh, conference this year. Uh, great presentation. But heart, head, heart. This uh, concept sort of refu uh, refers to leading each patient visit with your heart. Ask sort of how they're doing. Uh, you know, give them the human touch. Touch their toe, their shoulder. Empathize. Give them what they need using your expertise. Uh, you know, that's the head part of it, and then leaving them with a smile and a kind word. So leading with your heart, talking about what's going on with them, uh, given your, your expertise, and then leave them with a smile and a kind word. Um, and empathy comes first, and when that happens, the patient usually relaxes, listens to the next steps, and it's a great way to sort of encapsulate a visit. Okay, now that we've set the, the stage uh, for patient experience, we need to come up with a roadmap. And this is one thing that I mentioned patients are really looking for and providers are really looking for, not just for patient experience, but the incorporation of HIT into it. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, NEHIC and the HIMSS Patient Engagement Framework. Uh, fantastic document. It, it really does a, a great job of telling us sort of where we need to go in terms of 
what HIT can accomplish in the, in the coming years. It doesn't give any specifics for improving the patient experience at an organizational level. So we need to sort of look elsewhere for that. And this is an extremely simplified Venn diagram for patient care. It's sort of getting there. Um, it outlines the benefits of engagement and efficiency, and it hints at a few factors, but there are really no specifics. And people have been trying to put these diagrams together for, for quite some time. And this, this next one you're going to love. Um, it's just crazy madness. Um, really interesting. You can delve into this, and, and it is a great roadmap, but this, is, this can also um, sort of work as a visual of our, of our healthcare system. It's so complicated and so impenetrable and uh, just sort of crazy. So let's dial it back a bit. Um, I can list the directions you'll need to include on your roadmap. And I apologize, it is a lot of bullets. Um, I tried to put this into, visual, um, into a visual representation, but so much information that it was ultimately hard to do and I didn't want to make it too crazy for you. So, uh, all right, let's talk about audits. So taking care of your communication issues, your HIT issues, your workflow issues. Uh, in other words, taking the pulse of your patient community. So one thing you can do is survey your patients. Ask them what they would like in terms of communication, HIT. You know, you can do this informally. You can do it formally. You can ask them directly. You can uh, send them surveys, questionnaires. You can learn a, a little bit from uh, HCAPs. Uh, but in a limited kind of way. So gauge how you're doing with patient-doctor communication. If your patients are feeling disconnected from their care, you, you should be able to find out with uh, just a few questions. You can also ask, uh, sort of assess your current workflows to see when and how to incorporate a mention of, of patient portals and apps. Uh, if you work in a hospital, you know, would your parents benefit, sorry, patients benefit from a, a registration kiosk or a bedside interactive system, a tablet? or just something as simple as a waiting room app. These things you can, you can figure out by surveying your patients. We all have limited budgets, and um, that's always going to be a problem. And you know, with our limited budgets, there are things we can do. So we have to really drill down into our patient population to find out what that will be and what, what will be the most effective. Uh, okay, so once we've figured out what we, uh, what we can do in terms of HIT, and once we've determined the needs of our patients, we have to outline a vision of how HIT can help with the set goals, settle upon methods of tracking how technology will be, will be used. Uh, all right, let's talk about research and, and comparison of, of HIT. So there are 56,000 health apps out there and devices. It's a crazy number. Uh, it's going to be hard to weed through it. So we've all been through the process of you know, purchasing an EMR and a patient portal, it is painful. Uh, some of us have done it more than once. So, you know, it's okay to, to get help sort of getting through the weeds. There are consultants who can help you sort of frame a suite of technology to, to suit your demographic and your budget. If you need help, it's out there. Um, it's more reasonable than you might think. We do it here at, at the Iatric Services, too. I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, stakeholders. So I'll go into detail on this one on, on the next slide, but your stakeholders in the process will be anyone who has a point of contact with patients. So it's everyone in the, uh, the patient-facing realm. But even more importantly than that is your patient advocate group. I don't know how many of you have a patient advocate group at, at your organization, but I highly recommend it. If there's one takeaway you, you have from this presentation, it's get yourself a patient advocate group. A uh, great way to figure out sort of what patients are looking for in terms of their experience, satisfaction, and what they might use in terms of uh, technology. So they, they just have a great, unique perspective on, on what patients want to need. So highly recommend that. All right, high tech and high touch. We talked about this a little bit, so I won't dwell on it. But finding opportunities to bring sort of a higher level of respect to patients uh, in terms of open communication, the personal touch, and I guarantee it'll go pretty far in terms of engaging uh, your patients when you introduce technology into, your, into their lives. Um, I know it's, it's helped me, it's helped a lot of my family members, so uh, when you balance those, it's your, your heart's in the right place. 
Uh, and once you find opportunities for positive change, uh, workflow improvements internally, uh, you can train and workshop with staff, discuss your findings, share some of the best practices we've discussed here. Uh, you can refer to all the benefits I, I mentioned earlier. Um, one interesting way to do it is provider ratings, and uh, Cleveland Clinic has made an effort to really knock this one out of the park. They make their providers' ratings transparent. They have their own rating site on their on their website, and they make the uh, the results completely open to patients. Uh, patients can rate their providers and see sort of how they're doing. And in in doing that, those ratings have shot through the roof. No provider wants to be at the bottom of the list. And granted, this is sort of an extreme case, but it's absolutely worked for them as they've tried to improve the patient experience. So, you know, there are different ways to do it. Health grades, uh, Yelp, uh, but why not do it internally and make it sort of a race to the top? Um, it's an interesting way to go, at least, at the very least. Uh, so education and discharge, I'll sort of get into this in a little bit, but this is your last best chance of ed educating the patient at discharge. Not only on ownership of their health, um, but ways to exercise that ownership by signing up for the portal and downloading relevant health apps and, and things of that nature. And we're running a little bit tight on time, so I'm just going to run through the rest of these. Uh, focusing on the continuum of care, so even before they come into your organization, all the way through the, the perioperative or the, the um, omniscient care, and then once they're discharged. Uh, internal marketing, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Your patient advocacy group, uh, sort of piloting um, some of your HIT initiatives with certain Providers, there are lots of different ways to, to get things going. External marketing, again, I'll get, get to this in a little bit. Testing, regrouping, always testing, making sure things are going the way they're supposed to go. And then regrouping if, if they are or if they're not and talking about that. And then following up with surveys and, and tracking your numbers. Okay, stakeholders. This list is very long. I'm not going to torture you by going through the whole thing, but I wanted to give you sort of all the resources you'll need to tap into and include as, as stakeholders. And you'll see a lot of different groups on here. You've got um, everyone from the top at C level, and then everyone through the patient journey. So admitting, registration, social services, radiology, laboratory, uh, even food and environmental services, every patient-facing group is a rep uh, representative of your hospital. Anyone who sees patients, uh, everyone should should sort of know what's in it for, for the patient, know what's in um, quality care, what that means to the patient, and what their role in it can be. Uh, let's talk about a couple of studies in terms of rehospitalization rates and uh, comprehension in terms of discharge care. So this study from the, from the uh, Journal of Hospital Medicine, patient engagement should be as important to hospitals as patient experience. The inability of many patients to understand discharge instructions and their failure or inability to make a follow-up appointment with their doctor are major factors in readmissions. And that's been proven. Readmissions can be avoided uh, with better communication and patient engagement. And in another study of uh, patients who had just been discharged from, from the ED or the ER, 78% didn't fully understand what they'd been told in at least one area. And half, 51%, had problems in two or more areas. Scary stuff. OK, so let's talk about, uh, you know, we, we mentioned a little bit the, the last point of contact while under your care. So discharge, um, this is the last ditch effort to give them all the information they should be uh, empowered to use while under your care. So first uh, element of that is discharge instructions. So absolutely critical time to ensure that your uh, patients know what they have to do when they're on their own. Um, it's important to sort of hand that accountability over to them. So using the teach back method, very important here. Another way to know that they're getting it or not getting it is to use um, SSD, 
SPW technique, which stands for speak it, show it, write it down. Uh, and if you tell them what their self-care directives are, show them how to perform necessary functions, or show them a graphic of how to do it, write it down for them. Uh, so that's three different ways of learning, showing them uh, how to, and then show them a graphic of how to, and then write it down for them. Everyone learns in different ways, so you're sort of covering all your bases by, by doing it in all three ways. Easy access. So this sort of also happens to be the best possible, possible time at discharge to introduce patients to their portal, uh, their health apps, give them a pamphlet about the technology, let them know that their instructions will be on it, their discharge instructions uh, for easy access. If you have someone tasked with signing them up at the bedside for inpatients, do it right on the spot so it's e easy for them to sign in later. That's usually the first hurdle is just getting them to sign in, period. So uh, great way to do it. And then callbacks. I can't say enough about patient callbacks. These are hugely important in terms of continuity of care, keeping that relationship going. I know a lot of people do callbacks, but a lot of people don't. And they really ensure that, that patients know what their home care plan is. And it's also a perfect time to reiterate the importance of uh, of engagement, whether it's with their app or their portal or you know direct messaging, whatever is easy for them uh, in terms of getting all the information they need. They can message you securely. Uh, they can check medication side effects, so on and so forth. It's a critical opportunity to uh, enhance the patient experience. Great opportunity. So wrapping up here, uh, talking about lessons learned. Uh, here's some tips I'll, I'll sort of leave you with so you can mold them over as you consider your, your, your plan going forward and your plan to sort of enhance the, the patient experience. Shared ownership. So getting all the right people and departments involved, this goes back to the, the list of stakeholders I, I discussed. And I know I'm flying through these bullets, I apologize, but we will send you this slide deck so you can, you can sort of review all the, all the um, tenets of, of stakeholdership and every department that you need to get involved. But it'll really help to convey that, that ownership of the, the patient engagement effort, and it will be shared among those stakeholders. If you get those stakeholders together um, for regular meetings, it can really keep you on the right track in terms of your short-term goals, your long-term goals, and reviewing them uh, on a regular basis. And if efforts are backsliding, you can hold workshops and additional workshops to get things back on track. Uh, in terms of internal value being conveyed, this is totally critical. Uh, conveying the, the value of the project in terms of reducing readmissions, uh, keeping costs down, uh, avoiding breakdowns in communication, extolling the benefits of, of shared accountability with, with patients. It's something you can do in so many different ways. You can do it in meetings, newsletters, or intranet, uh, really as often as it takes to make sure that that value prop is is highlighted. Seeing patients in new ways. Um, this is one thing that a lot of us sort of deal with is uh, compassion fatigue and care fatigue. And one way to work on that is to get these stakeholders together on, on a regular basis and share some, some stories from patients, either let, letters that have been written or just anecdotes about, about patients. and. Uh, what they appreciated in your in your methods of care. Just a great way to, to renew some of that compassion. Uh, happy staff equals happy patients. This is absolutely true. Uh, we have to take care of our staff in order to take care of our patients and find those ways to battle compassion fatigue. And this has been proven time and time again. And again, in interest of time, I'm going to fly through the, the rest of these, but recognition, recognizing staff for for doing things well and for making a difference in, in patients' lives. Having that patient advocacy, adv sorry, advocacy group, absolutely, uh, if you don't have one, put one together. Uh, just a wonderful resource. And then each member of staff plays a part. And I, I spoke about this a little bit um, in terms of all patient-facing staff being able to uh, extol the virtues of, of your organization. All right. We're getting near the end here. I'm just going to go through some of these tips for introducing patients to new technologies and enhancing adoption. So incentives 
this could be anything from a free cup of coffee, a raffle, uh, any way to get to get patients to uh, to be interested in technology. Sometimes it's not going to sell itself, even if you tell them what the benefits are. Sometimes you have to throw in something a little bit extra. Uh, conveying value. So what's in it for them, what the features are, what the benefits are, and then um, having each point of contact be able to, to have that, that conversation with, with patients. Uh, providers should definitely stress that secure messaging is their preferred method of communication if that's truly the case. If it's not, if they're not going to use it, don't tell patients that they are going to use it because that will backfire spectacularly. Um, try to get your, pay, your uh, providers to use secure messaging as much as possible. And their staff um, should really see the, ben the benefits in that because it is asynchronous management. It's a lot easier to, uh, to manage that way. Uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, reported this, and it's, it's sort of, um, it makes a lot of sense. Just because we have information doesn't mean we're going to use it to our benefit. We're weird human beings, quote unquote, we often react irrationally. That's okay. If someone doesn't want to use technology, we can't force it down their throats. It's very important uh, to not beat them over the head with it. Benefits versus consequences. You can sort of couch patient engagement in two ways. You can tell patients how they can benefit from, from tracking their health once they're home. Or you could tell them what the consequences might be if they don't. And that usually comes down to who might use uh, technology to enhance their health versus those who really desperately need to take better care of themselves. So that's two different ways to approach patients. And add functionality. Keep your HIT fresh. Try to sort of iterate and reiterate on a regular basis and let your patients know when you do it. Uh, put it down on Facebook. Uh, and that leads me to the last point here, marketing. There are so many ways to market your technologies uh, in person, uh, but also on social media, direct mail, uh, phone messaging, signage, what have you. There's so many different ways to do it. This little button here, um, we've uh, produced these for, for a bunch of different hospitals. It just says, ask me about our patient portal. Uh, they wear that, it's colorful, draws attention to it. What's the patient portal? Well, let me tell you about it. So uh, with that in mind, we have one minute left and a quick polling question. Uh, hand it over to Michelle again. Okay, how prepared do you feel to go create your own HIT roadmap? Are you set up for success? Number one, I feel ready to tackle my roadmap. Awesome. Uh, I still need to do more research on HIT options. Okay. And then I'm not at all ready. Next steps and options aren't clear. And that's okay too. But either way, please answer honestly. Let us know uh, how prepared you feel. Click on one and go ahead and click on submit. And again, I'll give everyone just a couple of more moments to get your answers in, and then we'll close the poll and, and show the results. All right, I still need to do more research on HIT options, and that is understandable. Um, some of you aren't ready. Uh, next steps and options aren't clear. That's okay, too. Um, one thing I'd like to offer all of you on this uh, presentation today on this webinar is a free one-hour assessment. Um, I can call you. You can call me. I'll give you my contact information. And a totally free hour just to talk about where you are um, in terms of your HIT roadmap, and I can help you along your way also. So with that in mind, I will um, share my contact information with you. Those of you still on the call, if you'd like to send us uh, a question, i um, happy to answer any question you might have um, at this time. And just hang on one moment, and I'll show you my contact information after this Q&A period. I know we're sort of going over, but if you're still on, you have some time, feel free to ask me a question. Okay, I have a couple of questions here. We're starting to look at new technology that begins in data from trackers like Fitbit. What do you know about these in terms of their impact on patient satisfaction? Okay, great question. Um, their impact pretty much stems from any uh, 
patient-generated data source. Uh, so if patients have the ability to upload their, their information in terms of their, their progress, their steps, their exercise activities, for one thing, it's not going nowhere. The, the data isn't going nowhere. It's going somewhere. It's going to their provider. They know that they have a stake in their health, and they're sharing that with their provider. So with that said, that, that's such a great way to engage patients. That's an automatic engagement uh, sort of check mark. Um, they care about what's going on. So in terms of aggregating that data and analyzing it, that is you know, being worked out week to week, month to month, year to year. Uh, it's sort of tough to deal with all this data and put it together and make any sense out of it, but we are getting there. And patients love to get that, or sorry, uh, providers love to get that information from, from patients. So uh, trackers, fitness trackers, incredible way to, to promote engagement. OK, I have another question. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. With, uh, with tight resources, we don't have the staff that are able to focus on this full time. Do you have suggestions? Well. Uh, as a consultant, my number one suggestion would be a consultant. Uh, that's what we are there for. Um, we come in, we augment your staff, we can help you with any decisions that need to be made. We can help you sort of wade through the swamp of HIT um, in its current state. There's so many bad, so many bad uh, technologies out there, uh, more than more than the good ones. You really have to get through the bad ones to find the good ones and that's what consultants do. That's their bread and butter. So if you don't have the staff to do it, if you do have the resources uh, to hire a consultant, absolutely do that. That's my number one piece of advice on that, on that topic. Okay, any other questions, Michelle? Nope, no okay. other questions. All right, so with that in mind, let me give you my, my contact information here. You can contact me directly, and you can also, on the survey that we're going to be emailing out, you can uh, let us know that you'd, you'd like your free assessment for an hour. And also, just be honest, please let us know. Um, if you have any questions, we're happy to, to answer them, any questions at all about patient experience and patient engagement. So thank you uh, very much for joining me today.